Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Life Coach Cindy Chavez. Today is Wednesday. Happy Neville Day, May 15th, 2019. It is 4 p.m. in New York, 1 p.m. in Los Angeles, 9 p.m. in London and Sydney, Australia. Good morning there. It's 6 a.m. wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us for another episode of LOA Today. Your daily dose of happy, and I'm happy because not only is it Neville Day, but I get to reconnect with my good friend Cindy Chavez. Cindy, how are you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Well, Neville Day is always a good day, right? Yes. I mean, every day that has Neville in it is a good day. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, on days in the past when uh, it might not have felt like a good day, getting into some Neville has changed things, shifted things. It's always such right. a different perspective, right? So that's what that's what changes everything is our perspective. We change our perspective and everything seems to change. So, you're right. It's always a good day with Neville around. I'm a big fan and happy to be here to start a new book. Yay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We've yeah. been through six out of the ten main books that Neville wrote. We, I yeah. mean, I, I never thought we were going to go this far. You, you, I remember you suggested doing, <laughs> what was it? I can't remember which one was the first one you suggested. But uh, we, we did the book, and it's like, well, okay, let's do another one. And then, well, okay, let's do another one. It just kind of kept training itself, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny, too, because, you know, I, I actually, you know, one of the things we've talked about is with Neville, because his books and teachings spanned like a 20-plus year period. Oh, yeah. We always talk about the kind of evolution of his ideas and you right. know, where he started and then how we'll read something and say, oh, that sounds a little different. And it's like, okay, <laughs> his ideas are evolving. And I'm curious if we went back and listened to our first podcast. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? Like our ideas might be evolving as well because. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt of that because I remember vividly, especially when we did our first uh, special episode about a year ago right. on Neville where you just kind of introduced us to the basic concept of assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled. Right. And then later on, we did the first book, whichever the first book was. I can't remember which our, our first book. It wasn't the first book in the series. We just finished the first book in the series, Your Faith is Your Fortune. But whatever that first book was, I just remember my reaction was always the same. Okay, what does this translate to? What does this translate to? I know this is all metaphorical, and what he's saying here sounds <laughs> I was taught in Sunday school, but it isn't that. So what exactly does this mean again? And we invented the Neville decoder ring and all that. Now it's almost kind of like it's easy now by comparison. But, boy, those first few episodes, I was working. I was working hard. <laughs> you go take a shower afterward. Right, right. Well, I think that the first one we did um, was Awakened Imagination, if I'm yes, that's remembering right. yes. correctly. And so, you know, it's kind of funny to think that I know personally I have – a lot of books in my library and I have a hard time getting rid of books. And, <laughs> yes. and part of that is because I go back to them. Like at right. one point in my life, I never bought fiction books. I would check fiction out from the library. So my, my rule was that I would only buy books that were like reference books that I know I might want to go back to. And I, of course you don't know that before you've read it, but a lot of my books I'll revisit and Sometimes I read a book that I read five years ago, and it's like a brand new book to me. Mm. The book has not changed, right? Right, right. <laughs> well, with Zoom, actually, with what we're learning about how the universe works, I'm not so sure about that anymore. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a good point. <laughs> how, how could I prove that it's not the same? I can't prove that. I have no way to prove that. I don't know how to yeah, do that. <laughs> that's true. That's funny. So this book, this particular book, um, I have read before. But it has been a couple of years. Um, it's called Prayer, the Art of Believing. And so I know we were saying um, that we were both feeling surprised that if you would have told us 10 years ago we'd be doing a podcast around prayer, we would be like, yeah, no, I don't think so. No, not really. <laughs> you know, the point that I've come to in my life now, um, I had a I had a period of time where I did not like to use that word at all prayer. because mm -hmm. of past, you know, relationship to the word and past experiences. Oh, yeah. And someone would say, oh, could you please pray for my family? We're going, and I would be, I'd, I'd even have a hard time saying yes. It's like, okay, I'll keep you in my heart. I'll keep you in my thoughts, you know, but oh, I didn't too. want to use the word prayer. Me too. And now I have the sense that prayer and meditation and, you know, 
spells and all of these things, to me, they're just pretty much all the same. Mm. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> we give different names to them, but, you know, uh, after practicing lots of different paths, it's like they're all converging. It's like, no, it's just all the same thing. It is me using my thought power and my energy to project something somewhere in the world, mm. to, pro- to project a blessing or a healing or some kind of outcome somewhere. Um, so it's all in that metaphysical realm where hopes and dreams and wishes and thoughts and brainstorms and prayers and meditation, all of that stuff is happening. Mm-hmm. Yep. I don't have a problem with the word at all anymore. That's good. That's I very know. good. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's very good. Um, by the way, I want to remind anyone who's listening to the live stream, and I do see a few people have uh, filtered into the room here. Um, if you're just listening to the live stream and you have questions or comments that you want to share with us, you know, feel free to type them into the special live stream version of the comment section. Now, we're live streaming on YouTube, and if you found us, you found us through one of the links on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or something. Um, but here on YouTube, live streaming comments are different from regular comments. So you have to, if you're on like a small device, a handheld device, scroll to the bottom, you'll find the comment section there. And that, that way you can uh, share your comments with us, which we'll be, we'll be glad to include on the show. Um, in fact, yes. I'll be checking periodically to see if anybody is typing something that needs to be addressed directly. Um, I would love, and I just want to put it out there. Like I love, you know, this, we both do. We love to have some interaction and some Q and a and comments going on. And if you've got a, you know, any kind of thought or comment about how prayer, how you view it or Mm. how it's affected, you know, you in your life or how you've used it, or maybe you don't like the word at all. Like I said, there was a time I didn't like the word at all. I'd love to hear. (laughs) Well, I I mean, I can just tell you when you, you suggested to me after last week's show, we were talking about, so what do we want to do next? And you suggested this particular book and I instantly had a resistant response to it my body just kind of resisted oh no not prayer but then <laughs> i allowed my my mental my conscious mental process to override and say well wait a minute this is neville we're talking about here and the one thing i can count on with neville is that decoder ring the decoder ring neville never uses words the way that i'm used to using them so he doesn't use god the way i'm used to it he doesn't use kingdom the way i'm used to it he doesn't use jesus he doesn't use christ he doesn't use any of it the way i'm used to <laughs> bound to use the word prayer differently so that's how I was able to convince my subconscious mind, okay, we can actually talk about prayer and not have a, a hissy fit. And my subconscious mind said, oh, all right, if you insist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, too, as we, if you are familiar at all with, with hermetic principles, um, when you're going through Neville, like every once in a while, one of them will just pop out. I'll be like, that's a hermetic yeah. principle, right, which most of the time isn't going to mesh really well with, with a Christian idea. On the surface, anyway. On the surface, yeah. Right. But, um, but they're all there in this particular, I think we're going to get through maybe two chapters at least today. This is a short book. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the first chapter is sort of introducing this idea. And I think that in these two chapters, we're going to see, uh, some of those principles kind of played out and they're very metaphysical. And yet we, we talk about them with Abraham as well, like two sides of the same coin. I read a book recently where the guy said two ends of the same sausage and you have to eat the whole thing and crack me up. Um, so two ends of the stick, you know, Abraham talks yeah. about what end of the stick. If you pick up the stick, one end is health and the other end is, you know, dis-ease. Um, and so I think we're going to get into that with Neville. But if you're ready, I'm ready to just... I am. I actually want to do one thing before we get started, because I, I you'll remember, Cindy, a number of months back, I used to do promos earlier yes. in the show, and then I started doing later. And I've been looking at the the numbers of you know, when people are listening and what they're liking and so forth. And I've decided, okay, let's do them a little bit earlier again. So I'm going to do Go the promos it. now and get them out of the way. Um, get them out of the way. They're actually very important. Um, and it really comes down to this. Are you a subscriber to the podcast? It's just that simple. And if you are a subscriber, thank you. We love you and we appreciate you. There are a lot of you. We know about that. Um, if you're not yet a subscriber, and, and you'll see in a moment when uh, we get into Neville, just how deep we get into these kinds of things. 
but all of the topics that we address, and there's a wide range of them. It's not just Neville, it's Abraham, and it's, you know, practical application in life and SRT and all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, we're just, we're, we're just exploring the world of source energy in so many different ways. So if you are interested in all that kind of thing, be a subscriber because that's how you get notification every time. One of our episodes has been published, and you got it right on your smartphone, or even if you're using a you know a desktop or a Mac or a PC or something, um, you you can play our episodes anywhere. So become a subscriber and get all those things coming right to you. And it's really easy to do. Just go to the homepage of our website, loatoday.net, and right there at the top, it will detect what kind of device you're using and give you instructions for your particular device. So you can just click right through and click, 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 and just like that you are a subscriber. And then, of course, once you're a subscriber, make sure you're sharing that you're liking the episodes because that's how more and more people find out about us on social media. So subscribe and share is the message of the day. That's so funny. I was thinking about um, my husband watches this guy on YouTube, and I've seen him, and I can't think of his name. I wish I could remember it, but he's a science. He teaches science, Mm -hmm. cool science. And I think he told this story. I kind of heard it in passing and turned around and thought it was so funny, but I think it was his little child, somebody's little child that they were tucking in for bed and the little, you know, like a three-year-old or something said, he said, okay, good night. He said, good night. He said, like, and subscribe. <laughs> and his dad said, what did you just say? And he said, isn't that what you say when you're saying goodbye? Because he watched his dad do this podcast so many times and say at the end, goodbye, like, and subscribe. But That's didn't know what it meant, but I, now every time I hear it, I think about it. <laughs> By the way, that reminds me, I, I also have forgotten to mention that since we're live streaming on YouTube, we're also looking for subscribers that way. So subscribe on YouTube. And it, I, if Alex were here, she'd be explaining this better than I. But uh, just a reminder, too, when you subscribe on YouTube, next to the subscribe button, if you're using a smartphone, there's a little bell character. If you tap that bell character, you'll be notified every time one of our YouTube videos pops up onto your YouTube uh, application on, on the app itself. So you know, make sure that you subscribe that way, too, if you prefer to watch the videos, because um, we love having you watch us. All right. Excellent. Well, let's dive in. Are we let's ready? Let's do it. Let's go. Right. So we are today starting the book, uh, Prayer, the Art of Believing, by Neville Goddard. And the chapter one is The Law of Reversibility. So, Walt, I think we're going to get some of your... Um, we're going to need some you to weigh in with some of your physics knowledge when we get done with this chapter. Okay. Uh, okay. So he starts with a quote from Tennyson that says, pray for my soul. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Prayer is an art and requires practice. The first requirement is a controlled imagination. Parade and vain repetitions are foreign to prayer. Its exercise requires tranquility and peace of mind. Use not vain repetitions, for prayer is done in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So Neville is beginning to quote some of the verses from the Christian Bible. We talk about this a lot. Neville does this a lot. Oh, yes. He always has a very esoteric way of looking at those verses. He says, the ceremonies that are customarily used in prayer are mere superstitions and have been invented to give prayer an air of solemnity. Those who do practice the art of prayer are often ignorant of the laws that control it. They attribute the results obtained to the ceremonies and mistake the letter for the spirit. The essence of prayer is faith, but faith must be permeated with understanding to be given that active quality which it does not possess when standing alone. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. This book is an attempt to reduce the unknown to the known by pointing out conditions on which prayer are answered and without which they cannot be answered. It defines the conditions governing prayer in laws that are simply a generalization of our observations. The universal law of reversibility is the foundation on which its claims are based. All right, so he's going to start talking now about the law of reversibility, which he says he's based the claims of prayer being answered on this law in this book. So he says, mechanical motion caused by speech was known for a long time before anyone dreamed of the possibility of an inverse transformation, that is, 
the reproduction of speech by mechanical motion, the phonograph. For a long time, electricity was produced by friction, without ever a thought that friction, in turn, could be produced by electricity. Hmm. Whether or not man succeeds in reversing the transformation of a force, he knows, nevertheless, that all transformations of force are reversible. If heat can produce mechanical motion, so mechanical motion can produce heat. If electricity produces magnetism, magnetism, too, can develop electric currents. If the voice can cause undulatory currents, so can such currents reproduce the voice, and so on. Cause and effect, energy and matter, action and reaction, are the same and interconvertible. This law is of the highest importance because it enables you to foresee the inverse transformation once the direct transformation is verified. If you knew how you would feel were you to realize your objective, then inversely you would know what state you could realize were you to awaken in yourself such feeling. The injunction to pray believing that you already possess what you pray for is based upon a knowledge of the law of inverse transformation. If your realized prayer produces in you a definite feeling or state of consciousness, then inversely that particular feeling or state of consciousness must produce your realized prayer. Because all transformations of force are reversible, you should always assume the feeling of your fulfilled wish. You should awaken within you the feeling that you are and have that which heretofore you desired to be and possess. This is easily done by contemplating the joy that would be yours were your objective an accomplished fact, so that you live and move and have your being in the feeling that your wish is realized. The feeling of the wish fulfilled, if assumed and sustained, must objectify the state that would have created it. This law explains why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and why he calleth things that are not seen as though they were, and things that were not seen become seen. Assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled and continue feeling that it is fulfilled until that which you feel objectifies itself. If a physical fact can produce a psychological state, a psychological state can produce a physical fact. If the effect A can be produced by the cause B, then inversely the effect B can be produced by the cause A. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. So Neville is telling us in this chapter that cause and effect can be reversed, or that we can look at the inverse of cause and effect and say, if this causes this, then the reverse can be true also. So if the thing that I want to come to pass will create a certain feeling in me, then if I can tap into that feeling, the thing will be created. And and scientists all over the world are writhing in pain as he he writes all this stuff, because they say, no, 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 that's (laughs) not the way the universe works. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so what were your thoughts when he was talking about giving when he was giving specific examples of that inverse transformation of you know if heat can can create friction then friction can create heat and if etc <laughs> etc yeah the whole list yeah there was quite a list there no doubt and actually i was kind of teasing scientists would actually be uh, responsive to a lot of those ideas they wouldn't they would be resistant to the idea that it applies everywhere. But, I mean, clearly, uh, anybody who's ever played with an electromagnet knows that you can generate a magnetism using electricity, and you can use electricity to generate magnetism. I mean, yeah, they are almost reversible in a sense. Um, I'm not sure I'd call it reversibility, but I don't know, maybe a scientist would. I'm not sure. Uh, But the point is, yeah, they go together. Uh, And I think that's really what the key is. There, Concepts go together, concepts that we often consider to be opposites go together. And they really aren't opposites. They're actually complementary. They complement each other. Right. Because it's polarity, right? There's 
everything contains its opposite. Well, that's what he's suggesting here. Um, I, I'm look. I'm I'm kind of. I'm trying to to walk the tightrope between what would science say about it and what would uh, the mystics say about it. And it's truly a tightrope because there's going to be certain areas where they're just not going to agree. Um, but I'm trying to find those areas where there is commonality, where, where there is uh, sympathy, if you will. And I think this is where you mentioned the, the two-ended stick, um, health at the one end. You said disease. Actually, I would describe it as lack of health at the other end of the stick because it's, 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 right. a, it's a lack in its stick is what it really is. And, and when I understand it that way, if I were to use that rule of thumb as an explanation to a scientist as well as to a mystic, I think the scientist could say, oh, yeah, sure, well, I can work with that. And as I understand that, well, then clearly um, north and south aren't really opposites. There are, there, there are two drawn opposites of a drawn compass, but they aren't really opposites. They complement each other. They work with each other. You know, They're part of the same system, so to speak. Um, right. Whereas magnetism and lack of magnetism, those, those would be opposites. One would have, you, know, you have magnetism or you don't have magnetism. And yet, because everything contains its opposite, it's just one stick. And that's an interesting point. I, the point, actually, I was thinking about in a slightly different context while I was doing my, my outside walk today. But I asked myself a very simple question. The question is, is the opposite of anything nothing? Most people would say yes to that. I would say no. I would say the opposite of anything is lack of thing. And the reason I say that is, is there are two ways you can lack a thing. One is the thing just simply doesn't exist. And the other is, you don't have it. It's over there. <laughs> Those it are two exists, ways. To, you don't, right. It's still there, right? Yeah. What you were describing is is the idea of the thing that exists but isn't here. Mm -hmm. You weren't describing right. a lack of existence. You were describing right. the thing exists in another form, in another place, in another way, another state, something like that. Right. And, and that's something a, a scientist could really very readily identify with because you find that a lot in science. You find that in a lot of different places. So and that's think, where I think there's an overlap. There's a big overlap going on. Here well, and I think the overlap is getting bigger. Yeah. Right? I mean, we've seen that just in the last 25 years that science is now validating a lot of things that were considered mystical at one time. And science is influencing mysticism. It's working both directions. That's what's so cool about it. <laughs> that's perfect because that's what we're talking about. Yes. If science can influence the mystics, then mysticism can influence the scientists. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Are we ready to tackle chapter two or were there, was there anything else in this? I feel like this chapter was sort of an introduction. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything. Yeah. Else it's like. Out. It's like he's defining terms and, and defining concepts. I never heard the phrase law of reversibility. That's an interesting phrase. But uh, I, I, I can tell just from the books we've read before, when he's doing something like that, he's doing it with a very definite set of in mind. So I'm eager to find out what happens in Chapter 2 with this law of reversibility. Right. And what I think is interesting is that Chapter 2 is titled The Dual Nature of Consciousness. Mm. And so um, being someone who likes to study uh, non-dualism, we'll see where he goes with this, since he says, a clear concept of the dual nature of man's consciousness must be the basis of all true prayer. So, <laughs> <laughs> he okay. says, conscientiousness, or consciousness, sorry, consciousness includes a subconscious as well as a conscious part. The infinitely greater part of consciousness lies below the sphere of objective consciousness. Um, you know, I want to say I have heard this described before um, in classes that I've taken, like that dealt with um, hypnotism or neuro-linguistic programming, uh, talking about what's conscious and what's not conscious. And the description that I've always, you know, that impacted me was the idea of that the conscious part of us is like if you look at an iceberg, you know how we have the expression that says something is the tip of the iceberg? Well, that's because icebergs are huge, and all we generally see is just this little part that's poking out, right? That if we could look at our consciousness, that the conscious part of our consciousness is that tip of the iceberg. So, like, for instance, when we make decisions, very often they are made with that part of our consciousness. And... It's a very small part. So our subconscious is often calling shots, <laughs> right, well, without I, us really knowing it. And I want to raise a question that I've raised many times before, but I just want to touch on it briefly here 
to just kind of create a frame around what we're talking about, because there, there are many terms that we use here in deliberate creator, conscious creator circles, but also that they use in psychology and other fields as well. And they get used a wide variety of ways. One of them is ego. I, I've had a lot of discussions lately about ego. Subconscious is, is another one of those. And Neville has a very specific idea of what subconscious is, although he usually describes it metaphorically, so it's kind of hard sometimes to nail it down. But subconscious is one of those things that just kind of, depending on who you talk to, you're talking about different things. So I just wanted to ask you, what, what do you think Neville is saying when he says subconscious or when he refers to the subconscious mind as separate from the conscious mind? Well, he's talked to us before about this and been very definite that our conscious our consciousness is just one thing and that it sounds like we're saying there are two things when we say our conscious and our subconscious. And he said, it's one thing, but in order to explain the different functions, it's easier to just look at it like it's two separate things. Mm -hmm. He talks about our conscious mind, for instance, in his method of conscious creation, he would talk about our conscious mind recognizing that we desire a certain thing, mm -hmm. but that the seeds of manifestation are, or that the manifestation itself is actually created by the subconscious. The subconscious is the part that does all of the creating, according to Neville. Mm -hmm. When we usually talk about subconscious, we're talking about something that's below the surface of our conscious mind. We're not recognizing it. It's something that we don't pay attention to. It's, it's under the surface. And I think that he also, uh, uses that. Mm -hmm. now, it's interesting that you bring up ego because ego is the part of us that feels separate. Ego yeah. is part of me that says I'm me and you are you and we are not, you know, we are different and I am over here and I'm special. <laughs> and, you are. and what we know is that we, that that's, that's the, the dual part. That's the dualism is that mm -hmm. we're all separate. Mm -hmm. and when you talk to people that study non-dualism, they will say, well, but that's like saying, Oh, look at, you know, looking at the ocean and the surfers and saying, look at the wave, look at this wave. Oh, here's a big one. And look at that wave. Oh, that wave fizzled out. And look at this wave. It's, it's gigantic. Right. And it's all just the ocean. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've heard the idea that trees are actually, it's actually not trees. We look out and we say, Oh, there's a thousand trees in this grove, but they're all connected under the ground. It's like one giant tree. So <laughs> an activity that we have. And I think it, it can be seen here too with our subconscious and our conscious mind. They're one. They may operate differently. We, we can make that distinction, but that's my understanding anyway. I Which, think that's a good, uh, that's good. That's a good yeah, description. Now I may tell you something different. I don't know. <laughs> well, speaking of telling you something different, I wanted to run an idea by you and see what you think. Cause I've been giving a little thought to this idea. What is this? First of all, was earlier in the week, I was thinking about what is ego, and I've been thinking about that for quite some time. I don't still have a definition that satisfies me. But subconscious, I'm kind of zeroing in on one. If I think of, and, and Neville says this very clearly, the subconscious mind is part of the conscious mind, but like you said, we differentiate them just to make it easier to describe things in a language sort of way. Um, to me, the, the conscious mind in its totality, including both the aware conscious and the non-aware subconscious, are part of the totality of our minds. Yes. And that mind is us connected to source because we are part of source energy. So like you described, the wave is part of the ocean. So, so we're the wave connected to the ocean of source energy. And that consciousness is the awareness of all of our connectivity to source energy. So when I understand it that way, then I think to myself, well, as I am a conscious person, I am always focused on something. Sometimes I'm, I'm defocused to a degree, but still I have, I, I have an awareness toward some piece of this reality that I'm paying attention to. Our conscious, the conscious part of us, yes. The conscious part of us, right. right. And, and so that, that focus becomes the definition of our consciousness. And anything that's outside of that focus becomes our subconscious because it's all part of our awareness, but the, but the conscious part is the part that we're actually studying. It's the part that we're, we're zeroing in on in some way and trying to understand and play with and enjoying and all the things that we do. And when I look at it that way, 
then I asked myself, well, one of the things we use in, like psychologists will use the idea, and, and you know, Tony Robbins and other teachers have used the idea of tapes. Like we have these tapes that play. Right. And these tapes keep, and we have all these old tapes that just keep coming up and coming up and coming up. Well, what's that? That's really nothing more than the awareness going on in the background that's been always been going on. And, and we never actually changed our, our sense of awareness about this part of the, the, the subconscious mind over here. So it just kept going with what we put there. Right. It kept going and going and going. And when I understand it that way, now I understand tapes better. To me, this model helps me understand what a tape really is. A tape is really nothing more than something I got going. And I just never went back to it again. Right. You know, I, I had a coaching session with somebody last week, and I have permission to share this because oh, okay. it's such a big kind of aha moment. But and, and, and my client recognized the moment themselves because they made a statement to me and immediately said, you know, I think that's just a story I've been telling for a really long time. Oh, wow. And the statement was this, because this client is in the midst of some really big changes mm. in their life, and the statement was, I'm not one who embraces change. Oh, my. And I think that that's a story that I've heard before, not just from this client, right? I mean, mm. that's one of those, when, when I usually use examples like, oh, I'm not good at math, or I never remember names, it's like those are stories we've all heard. If we haven't said it ourselves, we've heard multiple other people say them, Right. right. I don't, I'm not, I don't embrace change. I don't embrace change. And I joked with my client and said, oh, I bet you're one of those people that when you go to a restaurant, you eat, you order the same thing every time, right? And they said, yes, because I like it. And that's the thing I want. <laughs> but what was so great was that in this story, when my client said, you know, I really think this is just a big story I've been telling for a long time. I said, tell me about some of the big changes that you've navigated in your life mm. and all of these stories just came pouring out, right? Wow. Stories about huge moves across the country and changing careers and losing a position and all of these things. And I could hear this shift happening as they said to me, wow, I've never seen this about myself. I think <laughs> I'm an expert at navigating change. <laughs> I like it. So where was that story residing? I think in the subconscious. It might have been conscious at one point, right? At, mm -hmm. at some point, this person said, I don't like change. I'm not good at this. I don't embrace it. And then it just became the story. Yeah. And it was like. I, I, I think I take the word might out. It isn't might. It did. I'm certain that that is exactly what happened. You, you nailed it. And so, you know, I think that this is the same for all of us is. We, we keep creating our future with t yesterday's news. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it was false. It doesn't mean that this person never had a thought that, man, change really sucks. I am not dealing with this. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. They did. Um, because as human beings, we don't like change. <laughs> we just don't like it too much. Well, we don't like it when we're uncomfortable about something. We, we, we often want to just stay with the familiar. Yeah. You know. I mean, I recognize that every time I have to learn a new piece of software. This actually ties into a topic that I remember having a conversation with Joel Elston about, and I'm sure you'll you you will readily agree with this because you probably deal with it with you know, most of the clients that you deal with on a regular basis. And that is when we when we choose that comfort zone, it really is never very comfortable. No, it's actually quite uncomfortable in many ways. Right, but because we have built up this little this little uh, scenario in our minds that if we move out of it, it's going to be even worse. We say, well, this is actually pretty good. <laughs> right. And so we say to ourselves, I like this uncomfortable place I'm in. <laughs> and it's usually not worse. It's just that it's That's safe right. because it's safe because the reptilian brain of ours recognizes that we are still alive. So mm. it's like this thing didn't kill me yesterday. It won't kill me today. I'm just yeah, right. right here, right? <laughs> All right. Don't, so, don't tell that to the frog who's boiling to death, right? <laughs> Oh, that, that boiling frog has been a topic of conversation in my house for two years. <laughs> All right. So, so Neville says consciousness includes a subconscious as well as a conscious part. And the infinitely greater part of consciousness lies below the sphere of objective consciousness. So that's, that's the iceberg under the surface. Uh, the subconscious is the most important part of consciousness. 
It's the cause of voluntary action. The subconscious is what a man is what a man is. The conscious is what a man knows. I and my father are one, but my father is greater than I. Now we have Neville. We can break out the decoder ring and yep, add yep. another notch to it, and that is that now he is saying that the father is the subconscious, <laughs> and the I there is the conscious because he says. My father's greater than I. He says the subconscious is greater. So that's a nice dose of Nevilleism there. That's it. Yep. The conscious and subconscious are one, but the subconscious is greater than the conscious. I of myself can do nothing. The father within me, he doeth the work. I, objective consciousness of myself can do nothing. The father, the subconscious, he does the work. The subconscious is that in which everything is known, in which everything is possible, to which everything goes, from which everything comes, which belongs to all, to which all have access. So again, we've talked about Neville believing or teaching that the subconscious is what actually does the creating. Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about here, right? Everything is possible, everything goes, everything comes from there. Okay, so he says... What we are conscious of is constructed out of what we are not conscious of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful, right? So yeah. the things that we're aware of, is, this is the thing we say all the time. When someone says, well, I don't know what my thoughts are doing. We say, look around. Exactly. I, don't know what's, I don't know what's in my subconscious. I don't know what's under the surface. Really, look around. Yeah. Because what you're conscious of has been constructed out of what you're not conscious of. Exactly. Not only do our subconscious assumptions influence our behavior, but they also fashion the pattern of our objective existence. They alone have the power to say, let us make man objective manifestations in our image after our likeness. So now he's equating, again, the power of the subconscious to be the power of God. He, he's making this parallel that as there, the Bible verse says that God said, let's make man in our image and after our likeness, he's saying that whatever's in the subconscious is saying, okay, let's create this. <laughs> and he's also drawing a very direct correlation between man and objective manifestations. Yes. He's saying man is an objective manifestation. Right. This is really, really powerful ideas. He says the whole of creation is asleep within the deep of man and is awakened to objective existence by his subconscious assumptions. Within that blankness we call sleep, there is a consciousness in unsleeping vigilance. And while the body sleeps, this unsleeping being releases from the treasure house of eternity the subconscious assumptions of man. But something that's interesting to note about sleeping and consciousness and all of that, um, I have read before that our brain actually has more actin. I know brain, consciousness, mind, different things. But just to say, our brain actually has more activity going on when we're sleeping than when we're not. Isn't that strange? But it's true from what I've heard, yeah. Yeah, I always had this idea when I was, you know, a kid. It's like, well, when you go to sleep, everything just turns off. You yeah, know? right? <laughs> it's not true, yeah. Prayer is the key, which unlocks... By the way, I, I, before you go on, I, I want to just make a little side comment. This is another metaphorical thing, but... Yeah. If you want to understand that concept a little bit more about how the brain is so electronically active when we're asleep, you can equate sleep with a reboot of a computer. And when a computer reboots, everything's running. The RAM's going crazy. The hard drive is going nuts. The interface is doing all this stuff. I mean, it's just, it's running it. It's doing everything at full capacity to do this complete reboot of the computer. And from the There's outside, somebody's... it seems like it's down. Like nothing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, my screen is still like, <laughs> blue or whatever. Hopefully not blue. Yeah, if you, if you, if you could put a monitor on it, you'd see CPU 100%, hard right. drive 100%, memory right. 100%. I mean, it's just like everything going crazy. <laughs> it's, a real, it's a good analogy. It's, I think it's a true one, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Neville says, prayer is the key which unlocks the infinite storehouse. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Prayer modifies or completely changes our subconscious assumptions, and a change of assumption is a change of expression. 
I want to talk about that for a minute okay. because, you know, we've, I've actually said at the beginning uh, that I have a, a sense that all of these things, all these modalities um, are very similar to me, if not the exact same between mm-hmm. calling it a prayer, calling it, you know, affirmations, meditation, spells, whatever we're calling it. Um, he says prayer modifies or completely changes our subconscious assumptions and a change of assumption is a change of expression. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to me that it's like you were using the metaphor of programming earlier mm-hmm. or tapes. You were talking about tapes, right? Right. Um, these tapes that are running. And so my question is, is that what we're doing when we're praying? Then we're just erasing the tapes or reprogramming the programs. You know, he's saying it changes, right? The assumption of the subconscious. And so it sounds to me, it reminds me anyway of the outcome we usually want. I'm not saying we get it, um, but from using affirmations. Like if I'm going to go through the day, remember a year or so ago when I decided I was going to do a thousand affirmations a day of I feel. Yes. And I was doing a thousand affirmations for 10 days in a row. I feel rich. I feel rich. I feel rich. I feel rich. Even when I didn't feel rich. And boy, when I started out, it it just was like ridiculous. I feel rich. I feel rich. I feel rich. But a day or so into it, it started feeling really good. And money started coming in too. (laughs) So is that what I was doing? I was changing the assumption because I know he uses the word assumption a little differently. We're talking about assuming a feeling or maybe a presumption, but the assumption before the affirmation was different, right? It Mm -hmm. was, yeah, I'm not that rich, and I don't feel too rich. I'd like to be richer. I used to joke about, I can say I'm rich, and my subconscious or my inner voice will say, no, Bill Gates is rich. You're not rich. (laughs) Okay. So I feel like prayer, meditation, affirmations, affirmations, spells, chants, whatever you want to call it, there's probably 20 more words we could add to the list. Those are things that are, according to Neville, changing our subconscious programming. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I would, <clears throat> I would add to that. Um, when you were talking about how you did the affirmations, you, you did, I feel rich a thousand times a day. Mm-hmm. And at first it was just, you were just being repetitive. And then at, over time you, you started to build a feeling on it. I think that is a really, really important point. And the reason I think it's important is um, I've been looking a little bit on Neville communities, particularly on Facebook, to see, you know, how they talk about this stuff. And I've been seeing in at least a few different situations where people talked about how you can think the same thought over and over and over and over again, but if you aren't feeling it, nothing's going to come out of it. And I think to myself, what you just said, yes, if you think the same thought over and over and over again, You actually have a few ways you could go there. I mean, you could literally think the same thought over and over again and say to yourself, this is so boring, and you get into a bored place. And you just stay in that bored place, and it's a feeling of boredom. And so you produce (laughs) all the stuff that's associated with a feeling of boredom. Or, as another alternative, you could be in a place of joy about it. You know, you get more and more excited. I I feel rich. I feel rich. I feel rich. You You could be building the excitement as you do that. The point being... I don't think that it is meaningful to say that you can have thought separate from feeling, which is the basic idea that I was, I was reading in the Neville group I was looking at. I don't think that's actually possible. I understand their point. Their point is if you have thought and you don't have feeling associated with it, then you're not really getting anywhere. Uh, but I also want to point out there's the Abraham concept, and I think that's what you're kind of alluding to here, that the more that you focus on something, you build the feeling. The feeling was always there but it was very, very low volume. And the more that you stay with it, the more the feeling grows. Now, the feeling is not going to be an absolute objective thing. It's not necessarily, I feel rich is going to produce wealth because it all depends how are you feeling about it. If you're feeling bored, it's going to produce more boredom. If you're feeling poor, it's going to feel, produce more poorness. You know, it, it depends on what you're feeling about it. But the feeling will build, and that's the key point. If, if, we, if we understand that by focusing over and over and over again, we're building feeling, then now we begin to see the purpose of doing re- repetitive affirmations. Well, and you know, when you, when you think about it from a different standpoint, like what about people that have 
um, been verbally abused. Yes. Right? Over a period of time where they might not have really believed or bought into it at the beginning, someone right. telling them that they were worthless or that they were, you know, no good at whatever it was they were trying to be good at. Um, that, But over time, hearing that, I mean, think what would happen to a child if every single day we told them something that was detrimental. Eventually, they'd start to believe it. And they, exactly. And, and, you know, they would start to make it true. Right? They would start to create a reality that made it true because that's what they thought. And so it works the other way as well. Right. And I'm not a big fan always of affirmations, especially when they don't feel true. Yes. Right? It's like because then you just feel like you're lying to yourself or like you're just being disingenuous. Like this isn't true at all. So, you know, there are some ways to change. Well, you're also setting yourself up. You're setting yourself up <laughs> for getting results that you don't want. Right. Just because, I mean, you, you picked the phrase, I feel rich because it felt good to you. That's the way right. you explained it then. And that yeah. was absolutely the right way to go. Right. Because it felt so good to you. If right. that phrase had felt not so good to you, it would have led to a feeling that you didn't like a whole lot. Right. If and so, so sometimes, you know, if somebody says, well, I don't, I don't feel, this isn't true. So I don't like saying it. I like to add, I'm in the process of, or mm -hmm. I love, right? I love feeling rich. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Or I'm in the process of learning whatever, or, you know, right. uh, so there are ways to change affirmations to where they feel truer. Yes. And I don't want to get too off on that tangent, but I think it's an interesting idea that Neville is saying here that we are actually changing, uh, the, the assumption of the subconscious and that when we do that, that we start to change the expression of it. Right. That, that's, that's why we were talking about, um, I, I agree it was a bit of a tangent, but that's why we were talking about feeling associated with the affirmations. Right. Because that is how you reprogram the subconscious mind. That yeah. is how you change the tapes through that kind of repetitive behavior, that erasing and racing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. That's how you do it. And so part of it is being willing to stick with it until you see exactly <laughs> yes. the change of expression. Um, Neville says the conscious mind reasons inductively from observation, experience, and education. Okay. It therefore finds it difficult to believe what the five senses and inductive reason deny. <laughs> the subconscious reasons deductively and is never concerned with the truth or falsity of the premise, but proceeds on the assumption of the correctness of the premise and objectifies results which are consistent with the premise. So here again, our subconscious is not making a judgment. If, if you, you know, there's that story, I think it was Mike Dooley who tells a story about when he was a kid. I think he says an uncle came to stay with them or something and that the uncle was constantly saying, Oh, I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Mm, yes. I remember this, right? And he was like 11, the, you know, I think Mike Dooley said he was 11 years old at the time and he started like imitating his uncle. Like, he started saying, oh, I feel tired. And he said inside a short period of time, his friends would want him to come out and play, and he was like, oh, no, I'm exhausted. <laughs> and even as a child, he recognized, mm. wait a minute, you know? And so he stopped, and it switched. It's like we can talk ourselves into anything. We really can talk ourselves into anything. And I think that's what Neville's talking about here, right, when he says that the subconscious, it's not concerned with the truth. Like, it doesn't judge. The subconscious says, oh, we're tired? Okay. <laughs> yes. Let, let's be tired then. Yes, exactly. Right. And, and I, want, I want to add something to this, too. I, and I suspect this is where he's going in this chapter. The first previous chapter was about what he called the law of reversibility. Yes. Well, the law of reversibility, as he was describing it, was, yes, A can lead to B, or also B can lead to A, depending on which direction you're coming from. But what he's also describing here is a way of reversing things we don't want to have in our lives. Yes. I, my, one of my, you know, we were talking about affirmations and the famous, uh, Dr. Emil Kui, who is famous for the, for one affirmation every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Yes. And you think about that when you are sick and you're not feeling like there's any improvement. He had so many patients healed because of that affirmation. Mm -hmm. When you're saying it over and over, at some point your subconscious says, oh, okay, we're getting better. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. If your subconscious is what's creating everything, then that's what we're going for here. We're going right. for that shift. So Neville says the, this distinction must be clearly seen by all who would master the art of praying. Okay, the distinction between how the subconscious reasons and how the conscious reasons. Um, no true grasp of the science of prayer can be really obtained until the laws governing the dual nature of consciousness are understood and the importance of the subconscious realized. Prayer, the art of believing what is denied by the senses. And and I will say this is my favorite definition of prayer. Oh, okay. The art of believing what is denied by the senses deals almost entirely with the subconscious. Think about it. If you're meditating because you want to change something, if you're praying, if you're working a spell, if you're chanting, if you're using affirmations, chances are you are going to have to deny whatever you're seeing with your eyes and hearing with your ears, right? True. If I'm trying to use my subconscious to create something different, I'm going to have to be willing to not look at what my senses are telling me. Yes. And so that's what he is saying. Prayer, the art of believing what's denied by the senses, deals almost entirely with the subconscious. Through prayer, the subconscious is suggested into acceptance of the wish fulfilled, and reasoning deductively logically unfolds to its legitimate end. Far greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The subjective mind is the diffused consciousness that animates the world. It is the spirit that gives life. In all substance is a single soul, subjective mind. Through all creation runs this one unbroken subjective mind. Thought and feeling fused into beliefs impress modifications upon it. Charge it with a mission, which mission it faithfully executes. The conscious mind originates premises. The subjective mind unfolds them to their logical ends. Were the subjective mind not so limited in its initiative power of reasoning, objective man could not be held responsible for his actions in the world. Man transmits ideas to the subconscious through his feelings. The subconscious transmits ideas from mind to mind through telepathy. Your unexpressed convictions of others are transmitted to them without their conscious knowledge or consent, and if subconsciously accepted by them, will influence their behavior. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting on a number of different levels, and I want to come back to it when we finish because we got about uh, no five or six sentences left. But the only ideas they subconsciously reject are your ideas of them, which they could not wish to be true of anyone. Whatever they could wish for others can be believed of them. And by the law of belief, which governs subjective reasoning, they're compelled to be subject, they're compelled to subjectively accept and therefore objectively express accordingly. The subjective mind is completely controlled by suggestion. Ideas are best suggested when the objective mind is partly subjective. That is, when the objective senses are diminished or held in abeyance. This partly subjective state can best be described as controlled reverie, wherein the mind is passive, but capable of functioning with absorption. It's a concentration of attention. There must be no conflict in your mind when you are praying. Turn from what is to what ought to be. Assume the mood of fulfilled desire, and by the universal law of reversibility, reversibility, you will realize your desire. Yeah, this is... This is interesting to me on a number of different levels, but particularly in his use of the concepts of objective and subjective. Mm-hmm. This, this is a, a topic that I've been interested in for many years, believe it or not. It, and listeners are going to say, who the hell cares about objective versus subjective? What difference does it make? Why is that important to you? And, and I have to admit, I'd, have, I'd be hard pressed to explain why it's important without going into a long, long story, uh, which I won't do. But uh, I've, I've long adopted the idea that we live in a subjective world and that we are involved with others subjectively and that the idea of objectivity is an illusion. And on the surface, it sounds like he's contradicting me here, but actually, I don't think he is. I think he's actually, 
I think he's actually underlining what he's what I'm saying, what what, what I'm believing. You. Yeah. Because right. he describes the word objective. The first use of the word objective in this chapter is about objective manifestation being the equivalent of man. That man is an objective manifestation. And I understand that in the sense of typically when we think of objective, we think of the observer, the person yeah. who is doing the observing. So if man is the objective manifestation, that is another way of saying man is the focus of the attention producing or well, let me say it differently. He is the focus of the attention on source energy that produces man as a physical being. And in that physical beingness, he is in a sense, the object of that creation. Yes. And so that becomes the objective essence of it. And then once man is objective in that sense, then he himself within his own realm ex- explores his own realm subjectively. And so I have to see that as the way Neville is, is contrasting objective and subjective, which is fine. Uh, that that works for me. Um, and it also works for me in the sense that once again, objective is, is also an illusion because all of physicality is an, is an illusion. Everything in, in the physical universe is an illusion that's been created by thought, by thought and feeling imposed upon source energy, creating these wonderful illusions that we call reality. Yeah. It's all in our head. Yeah. So, Everything I mean, it's, all in our head. It, 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 it's a little bit of a round the, you know, the clubhouse turn in order to try to explain all that stuff. That's Neville, though. It is Neville. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think he's accurate. I, I think it's a very accurate model he's described here to yeah. understand what the nature is of man within the realm of source energy and what is like, what things are like within man's realm. And it's, it's just a, it's a nice little metaphor he set up. I like yeah. it. And the nutshell here of, you know, the subjective mind is completely controlled by suggestion. <laughs> mm, yes, yes. You know, uh, he talks in this last paragraph about uh, that ideas are best suggested when the objective mind is partly subjective, that is, when the objective senses are diminished. Um, and he talks in some of his other books about using these methods. In this case, it would be prayer, the idea of prayer the way he is uh you know, remedy, the remedy he is giving and the prescription, the way he says prayer works, but doing it as you're drifting off to sleep. Cause at that point, your senses are diminished. Mm-hmm. He also talks about something that, that we always just said, he's talking about meditation. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> like with the body not moving and, you know, he would give a big description. We said, well, it sounds like meditation to me. Uh, and so, so I, I'm putting all these thoughts together from the different things that we've read of Neville, but it sounds to me like Neville's saying that the optimal time for praying would be, uh, one of the times anyway, would be that time when you are kind of drifting off to sleep. That is a constant theme of his, yes. Which I think is interesting because most of us were brought up with bedtime prayers, or many of us were. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thinking, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> But now we're understanding them outside of, what do you call it, the, the ceremony of it? Is that the word he used in the first chapter? He did that, use that, yes. Yeah. We're, 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 we're not using it in a ceremonial sense. Now we're using it in a truer sense, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so the next chapter that we'll be with next week is imagination and faith. So I'm looking forward to it because I love everything that he talks about using our imagination. <laughs> I do too. And, and, uh, I love the fact that first of all, we did two chapters that came out to exactly an hour. I mean, we can't really ask for better than that. So that's terrific. Um, secondly, I also <laughs> like to make sure I, I always remember to do this at, at the end of every show. And I want to make sure I do it in this case too, because I, I am so fortunate to work with these wonderful life coaches and people who are energy workers and so forth. And Cindy is definitely one of them. So Cindy, tell people how they can reach Cindy Chavez on a professional basis and, and you know, learn about your coaching or even just reach out to you just because they want to ask you a question. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. You can find me online, Cindy Chavez.com. It's C I N D I E C H A V E Z. There's a contact form on my website. I answer all of my email. I would love to hear from you, whether you um, need a coach or whether you just want to say hello, or give us a shout out. I would love to hear from you. Please. Sounds great. Me line. 
All right. Well, this has been great. Thank you for another great uh, Neville Day. Happy Neville Day to you, Cindy. And uh, we'll be talking again next week. Thank (laughs) you to our live stream listeners. And thanks, as always, to our podcast listeners who make up the vast majority of our audience. Without you, we wouldn't have a podcast. And we're so grateful to you. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.